Goedemiddag. Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to open this special academic ceremony of Maastricht University. My name is Jan Smit, Dean of the Faculty of Law and also acting pro-rector for this ceremony. And I welcome everyone present here in this beautiful aula of our university and also everyone, all colleagues and everyone else watching this ceremony online through our live stream. We cannot see you, but we know that you are with many. I welcome in particular our colleague, Professor Van Erp, chef, and Trix and all your family and friends, all sitting here in the first row. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask Professor Van Erp to come forward to give his afscheidsrede, valedictory address. And the afscheidsrede is of course an academic tradition um, and the way to say farewell to the academic community one has been part of. I think that when one has been a professor or still is a professor, it's never entirely possible to say farewell to that academic community, but you will give it a try today. Um, Chef, you do so after having been a professor at this university for 24 years. You were appointed on the 1st of September 1997 as professor of civil law. Some colleagues present here, including uh, myself, um, remember that you came here and succeeded on this post the uh, renowned professor Wolfgang Minke. In the 24 years that followed, you performed the many roles that academics have as a teacher, as a researcher, as a leader, and as a supervisor. More about that later. And as someone who had an impact on many, both inside and outside of this university. So in this ceremony, we celebrate. We do not celebrate that you are leaving this university and our faculty of law but we do celebrate the fact that you did many things here with us and also will continue to do things uh, in the future and the lasting impact that you made on colleagues both here and outside of Maastricht. Professor van Erpen, I now invite you to come forward and give your valedictory address. Mr. Prorector, dear Dean, dear colleagues and friends, and everyone uh, giving me the honor of your presence, either in person or online, and a particular word of welcome to students I know all over the world who at the request of their professors are following this lecture, and particularly my students' comparative legal systems at the University of Trento. All good, all good things come to an end, and researching and teaching comparative European and global property law has been a good thing. But what does it mean that they come to an end? To the singer Nelly Furtado, who has a song with this precise title, the end is hidden in doubts, and particularly when she sings, don't like reality, it's way too clear to me. Now, to me, as a comparative property lawyer, however, reality is not clear at all anymore. And whether I like it or not. What we perceive as reality is undergoing rapid and far-reaching changes. And these changes can be seen in the physical world around us. The natural environment in which we all live is under threat because of climate change, but also we no longer only live in a physical world. Next to our natural environment, we created a coded environment, resulting in a virtual reality. Now, both realities now increasingly mix and are becoming interdependent and even inseparable. Now, the Internet of Things is a, is a good example here. Physical things more and more need to be connected with the Internet to share data collected through sensors in return for input, which allows the thing to function. 
An example are laptops. Another example are doorbells with audio and video access. Um, this development towards a hybrid world is already by itself challenging, certainly from a legal perspective. But there's more. We are asking questions to which no clear answer can be given yet, such as who, who owns the data in your coronavirus tracing and or tracking app? Or who owns the data in your corona check app, your green pass? But this is not the only challenge. Because our physical world is under threat, building a virtual environment carries the inherent risk, and to quote Nelly Furtado again, that we miss everything daydreaming. We live in a world on screen. However, we are still human beings in a physical habitat. If daydreaming is an attempt to escape from this physical reality, it is not what we should do. But if it leads us towards being creative, it may bring the solutions we need. In this lecture, I will focus on some of the questions with which we are faced because of our reality becoming hybrid and not forgetting that our digital reality is only one of what should be our main concerns. Climate change, mass migration, and the negative aspects of globalization, such as pandemics. So to me as a property lawyer, all good things come to an end, and you, I'm sure those of you who know my legal area probably guessed, is an extremely intriguing phrase. Now, what are these good things which are supposed to come to an end? Now, when I started to work on my PhD, Grant Gilmore's The Death of Contract was a book that made contract and tort lawyers reflect on what the essential differences and similarities were between these two legal areas. As Grant Gilmore argued that contract was drowning in a sea of tort. Now, years later, we know that both contract and tort law are still very much alive. But what about the law of things, particularly the comparative law of things? So 25 years ago, the end of your academic endeavors was very near when you intended to study the law of things from a comparative property law perspective. In fact, it proved to be a dead end. Comparative property law analysis was seen as hardly possible. It is only limited to certain very specific areas relevant for international commerce or not possible at all because in this area, European continental civil law was considered to be as fundamentally different from English and common law as you could think. And an attempt at integrated teaching could be no more than a mirage. The closer you would come to comparing property law systems, the more illusory the exercise seemed to be, at least so it was perceived. It is therefore quite interesting that in the same period that McGill Law School in Montreal decided that comparative property law could not be included in its bi-dural trans-systemic curriculum, Maastricht University, in its also new and innovative European law school program, did include this field in its curriculum. Now, years later, McGill changed its initial approach. And my assumption is that it was realized that the comparative method as such can be used in any area of the law if adequately applied. Now, it is precisely this adequate application of comparative law which I advocated in my inaugural lecture at this university on the 25th of September 1998, so almost on the day some 23 years ago. It is that method that lies at the basis of my teaching and research of comparative property law. So comparative property law at the end of the day, to use that word end again, proved not to be a dead end, but the very productive beginning of a comparative legal area that is now badly needed in light of the property law questions raised by, among other developments, the digital economy as one of the fault lines which our society faces. 
The development in the past 20 years or so of our hybrid real and virtual world with its enormous dependence on data and data streams has shown that comparative law can offer the, anal the analytic tools with which legal questions raised by the new data economy can be examined in a way that makes both clear that certain traditional approaches might still work, although perhaps with some adaptation, and others might not, resulting in the need to develop new solutions. Elsewhere, I argued that we could draw inspiration from how Roman lawyers developed their jus praetorium next to the jus civile, in what manner continental European lawyers built a Roman law-based jus commune next to local law, and by what means English law still develops equity next to the old common law. Perhaps we should build a new layer and I call that layer in my writings differential law that allows courts the freedom to look for more creative solutions in their quest to solve today's societal problems. This new layer could supplement and adapt existing law without obliterating what has proven of value over the ages. I discussed it, what I said in several writings, I'll leave it here, only to add that this new layer continues to build upon basic thought patterns which comparative property law analysis brought to, to the surface. Now, each Western type of property law system is ultimately based on that same foundation, sharing certain values, policies, principles, notions, concepts, and basic rules. And generations of students heard me say that in this very room. Now, even when a completely new solution has to be considered, this foundation cannot be ignored as it constitutes what we perceive as property law also in a technology-driven world. Now, I'm not arguing that this is some sort of natural law. What I'm arguing is that it seems as if our approach to how we interact as human beings among ourselves regarding the things outside ourselves, we follow set thought patterns. And in my writings and lectures, I explained this foundation several times, calling it classical property law, based on the leading principles of numerous clauses, transparency, and hierarchy. Now, in a lecture, which I gave several years ago, at the uh, University of Trento, I argued that today's property law is facing three major fault lines. Mass migration, climate change, and the digital revolution. With hindsight, I should perhaps have added the negative side effects of globalization, such as an increasing risk of pandemics. In all four of these situations, the existing fabric of society is at risk as it may become unstable. Now, these four fault lines develop against a backdrop of a growing yet vague feeling of overall insecurity. We are no longer so positive, so assured about what we considered as established certainties. With the rise of autocratic forms of government, the great values of democracy seem to be no longer respected. Judiciaries are seen as powers that should be checked and controlled to avoid a gouvernement des juges. And for most people, globalization was only looked at from a particular perspective, the perspective of being able to go on holiday all over the world looking at foreign societies from the comfort zone of a holiday resort, flying to and traveling anywhere, and in the expectation that you could always return home safely. Then the COVID-19 crisis came, making us all at once aware of the downside of globalization and that freedom, for example, to leave your house and go wherever you want and talk to anyone you want 
is in fact something very precious. Now, almost from one day to another, we went from old habits to new habits. Although if we could, we would like to deny what we call the new normal as much as possible. And it is against this background of growing uncertainty about our society, about our freedom, that we need to answer pressing legal questions. And in the following, I will primarily focus on the impact of the digital revolution on the law, knowing that there are other questions as well. A question property lawyers can no longer run away from is whether our present rules written in a different era for another mainly physical world still can lead to workable and acceptable results. We are confronted with what my good friend André van der Walt, who had the South African research chair in property law and who passed away too early, called a transformative change. André van der Walt, of course, was looking at transformation in post-apartheid South Africa, which led him to develop his theory of transformative property law. And in his book, Property in the Margins, he argued that after apartheid had disappeared, property law, and perhaps even more important, property lawyers, were facing an identity crisis. And in his own words, and I quote, my central hypothesis for the purposes of this book is that the standoff between the moral, political, and constitutional obligation to change and the cultural, doctrinal, and methodological tendency to resist, postpone, or minimize change is not only a fruitful, but an essential locus for critical reflection about property law. So, as a one-liner, no changes, no challenges. Further on in this book, it seems as if Van der Waal gradually argues that the essence of property law and of ownership is not exclusivity, so the negative side of ownership, but access, access to property, access to resources, access rights as a more positive approach. And certainly also in that respect, my good friend was a visionary legal thinker. Now, in light of these fault lines, which in the written version of my lecture I further describe, and considering how particularly, but not only, the civil law tradition struggles with its academically inspired desire for dogmatic correctness, where we now urgently need practical and workable solutions, we should perhaps go, as my master colleague Van Dijk already in 2004 wrote, in an article he co-authored, from a state of what can we do to what must we do. When thinking about IT developments, which I describe like blockchain technology, smart contracts, cryptocurrencies, and how the law should react, Comparative legal, the comparative legal method shows the way. Comparative legal reflection allows us to break through our path-dependent thinking. It makes us reflect upon what we consider as normal, how it should be, forces us to realize that in the past, very different choices could have been made, but also shows that underlying all diversity, although sometimes at a very deep level, the very basic foundations of property law systems seem to follow the same grid. The latter may seem to imply that when we start considering the legal consequences of new technologies and how the law should look at our more and more hybrid world, we cannot escape from these basic thought patterns. But at the same time, these thought patterns are so abstract and vague that they can only function when guided by policy choices policy choices we must make in light of today's problems. From an historical comparative viewpoint, the policy choices in the past were made, were like protection of ownership, 
The system was aimed at protecting commerce, promoting commerce, or protecting economic interest. We now add privacy and data protection. And we should not forget promoting the circular economy, policy choices to be made. At the very essence, property law is about relations, governed by rules between a subject and a relevant and considerable group of other subjects regarding an object, the things around us. Today, all of these elements are in a state of flux. A subject used to be either a natural or a legal person, but today's question is, can an autonomously functioning computer system, call it a robot, call it AI-driven algorithms, also qualify as a subject? Some courts say yes, and some, like the Court of Appeal in England yesterday, say no. Objects traditionally were things of a physical nature, but over the course of time, we accepted various types of intangibles, things you cannot touch, like monetary claims, public law licenses as legal objects. Developed as a field separate from general property law, we began to accept products of the creative human mind as an object, but we now also see the question coming up whether perhaps autonomously functioning computer systems can be recognized as having that creative mind. And finally, we are no longer so certain about the property rights themselves, as we begin to realize that the numerous clauses principle, as part of its substantive character, not only limits the number and content of property rights, but also qualifies those rights by including the relevant object and implicitly the subject in its definition. For example, by stating that ownership is the most complete right regarding a physical thing and you limit what ownership is. But what about not using resources? Is trade possible in the electricity you save by installing solar panels on your roof? Could non-usus, non-fructus, non-abusus be an object of property law? Now, until now, Solar produced electricity might be sold to an energy provider. You produce something which you sell. But what if you do not produce electricity, you save? Is that a thing you can sell? A not thing. Can such, what I might call synthetic objects, non-use, be recognized as a legal object? And what about ownership of data? From the perspective of, um, uh, from that perspective, a major legal problem now is whether we can accept, next to these synthetic uh, legal objects, categories of intangibles, e-objects, data as legal objects. So we don't know what legal objects are anymore. We don't know what you can own anymore. What is ownership? If we define ownership as their maximum power over a physical thing. Now, in various respects, synthetic objects raise problems comparable with data. Saving energy happens at various levels. Producers of solar panels and of energy-saving appliances, homeowners, governments promoting that we save energy, and so on. So with regard to data, we see that data can be created by various persons in a variety of connections. Now, my focus will be on data, but at the same time submitting that from a more theoretical viewpoint, the problems which property lawyers face with regard to how the law should and could react to combating climate change, and how the law should and could react to the hybrid reality in which we live might show striking parallels. A first problem that we encounter when we want to look at data as an object of property law is that the gathering, analyzing, processing, sharing, sorting, transferring, deleting, you name it, of data is governed by a web of multi-level contracts. So we start with contract law. 
In the written version of the lecture, I then explain the various contracts regarding to health. And then I say the first question therefore is, what is the object of the contractual obligation between a patient and for example, a healthcare provider or a health insurance company? The patient's counterparty here is of utmost importance because the aim and purpose of being allowed to use the patient's orally given or through physical examination discovered health data is essentially different. This in turn depends on the reason for which the healthcare provider or the insurance company is concluding the contract. The health insurer needs to be able to make a reasonable assessment of the insured's health to decide whether or not to insure a person. And if so, against which premium? Without a proper assessment of the risks, will the insurer run into serious financial difficulties and this most certainly is also not in the interest of the insured. The situation may be different if a health insurer is obliged by public law to accept any person within a given category. That's clear. The healthcare provider may certainly also have its own financial in interest. Doctors want to earn money. But the primary purpose of the contract is not that the patient pays money to the healthcare provider but that the healthcare provider takes care of the patient's health. The center of gravity in the former contract is more financially oriented than in the second contract. And given the different purpose of both contracts, it can be expected that a patient is more hesitant to provide the insurance company with access to health data than a healthcare provider. The patient and healthcare provider have a shared interest in the data because they share a common purpose, making the patient better. And this shared purpose is, of course, not absent in a contract with a health insurer, but financial interests of the insured stand against the health interests of the insured. Access to the patient's medical file is in both cases based on the contract which most likely will contain the required consent as referred to in the GDPR. Now, the final outcome of that analysis, which in the written version is longer than I say, is the following. A, the patient will have access to his medical file regarding all data. And B, the healthcare provider may also have access to all of the data, but his use is limited to the bounds set by the medical diagnosis. And C, the health insurer only has limited access to some of the data, given that the insurer's interest only partially runs parallel to that of the patient, and for a considerable part has a countervailing financial interest. Now a web has a spider in the middle, but who is the spider? In fact, here, it is neither a human being or a legal person, nor an animal, but in the, middle, in the middle of the web are data waiting to become active when accessed by the various parties involved. The spider in the middle is therefore not a subject, but an object. In this web of contracts, we see that each time the object of the contract is clear in the abstract, but which specific data in the medical file are being targeted for access and by whom and to which degree remains difficult to predict beforehand. Data management is needed here, making insightful in an orderly, efficient and effective way who has access, control, is entitled to portability, the possibility of erasure and who has the power to share, pool, and transfer the data. It looks very much like what's called data rights management, DRM. It should be asked what the object is of the contractual right in question, and given the web of contract, who manages in the sense of who decides the relative strength of those rights vis-a-vis -vis other rights, and who consequently prioritizes the right? Who has more rights in that field of 
medical contracts and lesser rights. Approached in this way, the problem becomes a question more familiar to property lawyers than contract law scholars. So how to decide this relative strength of a right concerning data or data right? How to prioritize various rights looking at it from the perspective of property law? Now, if we look briefly at the boundaries of privity of contract, it only binds the parties, we see that contracts for the benefit of third parties have been accepted, albeit to a lesser or minor degree, or larger degree, in both civil law and the common law. Now, conferring rights upon third parties is seen as less problematic than, understandably so, burdening third parties with duties, and a contract can therefore not create an obligation for a third party unless that party later agrees and becomes a party to the contract. Now, several techniques in contract law have been developed as a workaround to make it possible that personal rights do affect third parties. Chain clauses, which contractually bind a party to include certain clauses in her contract with a third party. Certain clauses are given third party effects, particularly with regard to exemption clauses, where the effect can be both negative, the clause prevents a liability claim against a third party, or positive, the clause can be looked, can be invoked by a third party. Now in data uh, transfer agreement, we find clauses which are meant to have an impact on so-called downstream agreements like binding a sub-licensee to the clauses in the main license. And then you are using contract law as a step which makes it close to property law. All of these attempts as a workaround proceed from the assumption that only persons can be bound by clauses emanating from a contract. It is a subject-specific approach. However, comparative analysis shows that the same workaround can also be looked at and given effect from an object-based approach. An English law recognized perpetual clauses relating, as an example, to freehold land as restrictive covenants binding inequity against any successor in title. Inequity, the extra layer that I defend we should add to our law, also in the civil law. In the early days, these restrictive covenants could burden the third party, but also even put a positive duty to act on her. And some US states still accept that latter possibility. So we then see a movement from a primary focus on legal relations between specific subjects to emphasizing that those legal relations exist between a subject and a relevant group of other subjects third parties regarding an object. The latter means that you are now entering the realm of property law. So, so the question, do data transfer contracts only create personal rights and duties, or do they express a deeper insight into what in effect are rights and duties regarding an object between a subject and a relevant and considerable group of other subjects? depends on your point of view. Do we look at data from a subjective or an objective viewpoint? We can see this reflected in the debate on data ownership. To put it in one sentence, again, I explain this more extensively in the written version. Opponents of data ownership, that you can own data, seem to use arguments more of an ideological subjectivist nature, and proponents more of a pragmatic, so, pro, so those in favor, more of a pragmatic objectivist nature. And in my view, neither is completely wrong nor fully correct. It is both. You have to look at both subject and object when you look at data and rights to data. I then in the written version give two examples the development of the law of leases under English law 
and the acceptance of expectation rights, Anwartschaftsrechte under German law. Now, when I analyze the use of data more from an objectivist than a subjectivist perspective, by looking at the various thought patterns which I described earlier as the framework that underlies Western systems of property law, it means that I will have to look at values, policy choices, principles, notions, concepts, and ground rules, the whole fabric of the law, taking into consideration what we accept as an object of property law, which in part is a policy choice, who can be a property law subject, which is also a policy choice, and against whom such a subject can maintain her rights and which property law re uh, relations are recognized. That would take quite a lot of time. So what I do is say to you, in the written version, I discuss the values on several pages, and having discussed the values, next steps in the analysis are the policy choices. Policy choice, how to govern data rights, and how data rights can be fitted into the leading property law principles of numerous clauses, transparency, and hierarchy. But the most complicated question is, can you formulate data sufficiently as an object for property law purposes, because you have to be more specific. I then argue in the written version that that is possible by formulating a workable definition of digital assets. And then the final step in my analysis is how to describe the right, so object, subject, the right, which a legal subject can have vis-a-vis -vis other legal subjects concerning these clusters of data, these digital assets. Any property law system has one set of rights which, depending upon the object, give its holder the maximum of rights, powers, privileges, immunities, to use Hofeldian terminology. Other property rights give the holder a lesser position, and to describe the hierarchy between, first of all, contract law being of a personal nature, and secondly, property law being of a real nature, and at the same time explaining that property law relations do not necessarily have to be absolute, but may depend on who the relevant and considerable number of other legal subjects are, Hofeld analyzed property law as a complex set of what he called multi-title relations. He meant that property rights are not rights in a thing, but a one subject against another subject. And I think that this is precisely what we need to do in the area of digital assets to create a legal status stronger than contract, but weaker than absolute civil law ownership. For that reason, already in my earlier writings, I defended that ownership of data is not the same as ownership of land, physical things, or as accepted in some legal systems, monetary claims. It's not the same as a product of human creativity. It's not intellectual property. Ownership of data is management, management of access, given the varying degrees of permission which stakeholders need as I described regarding data ownership rights resulting from the use of coronavirus tracing and tracking apps in an article. We already have management models we could look at, digital rights management, and we can look at how access is given at a more technical level, reading rights, writing rights, and so on. To me, this will be the challenge ahead for property law, not whether data, and more precisely clusters of data, can be an object of property law. To me, that is a given. They are already accepted as such in practice. They are, without any doubt, objects of contract law. But what the data rights concerning data clusters will be, what is your right against those data? Ignoring existing practice from an ideological viewpoint, saying, this must not be accepted, will not help us, because it will happen. It will only make problems worse. 
It will give people less protection. Give them protection. Arguing that consumers should not consent to give up their data and then focus on why they should not do that and how they can withdraw consent ignores that consent is more the rule than the exception and that people hardly realize that they give consent. Furthermore, whether the apex of data rights is called ownership, management, or any other term, the debate on data rights should be on content. It should be realistic, pragmatic, and taking into account differing interests of stakeholders. These are most importantly private persons who need protection of their personal data in a diffuse and global environment dominated by global tech companies looking for profit maximization by dealing in data and by states desiring to regain sovereignty and hence control over their citizens by building firewalls around them. Now, my final conclusion is that things which are an object of property law do not come to an end and that traditional property law is not dead. So my successors have a future. We will, however, have to accept that things can also be intangible, fluid, and non-rivalrous data, which has considerable consequences for how we look at the legal relations, the data rights regarding data. And the same applies to synthetic objects to which I could only refer, which might give rise to synthetic rights. So both data rights and possibly synthetic rights are an example of a new approach to property law, accepting that next to traditional property law, a new layer is needed, which I would call differential law, very much along the lines of the jus praetorium of Roman law, jus commune of pre-codified European continental law and equity in English and American law. And here we go. Um, what did come to an end are the good things I enjoyed being a professor of civil law and European private law at Maastricht University. I already retired some months ago, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic, this valedictory address had to be postponed. I taught both in the Dutch law program, where the law is taught from the perspective of a student who wants to become a Dutch lawyer, and the European Law School program, which is aimed at educating lawyers with a broad European and global perspective. The European Law School program provides the intellectual foundation for the extra layer that I think is needed to understand and guide legal developments that surpass national boundaries. However, we must never forget that at the end of the day, use in causa positum, ultimately, only in a concrete, actual, and localized case, does it become clear what the law is. In 1988, I wrote a contribution to a collection of essays published on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the Tilburg Law Faculty about a developing European private law. And I remember very well that three years later, I participated in the conference, the Common Law of Europe and the Future of Legal Education, held here in Maastricht, when the Maastricht Law Faculty celebrated its 10th anniversary. At that time, I could not have imagined how involved I would become in both the process leading to a more European understanding of private law, more particularly property law, and using that experience and the knowledge that I gained when I was teaching comparative European and global property law in the English language Maastricht European Law School program. It was an incredibly enriching experience also to co-found two law journals and being the first editor-in-chief, so one of the first open access and peer-reviewed law journals, the Electronic Journal of Comparative Law, now the European Journal of Comparative Law and Governance, and the European Property Law Journal, and co-founding the European Law Institute, inspired by the models of the American Law Institute and the ULC in the United States. 
I feel very fortunate that for me, academic research and teaching as such do not end with my retirement from Maastricht University, and that I will continue giving guest lectures at Trento University in Italy, working closely together with Elena Joriatti and Luisa Antonioli, here present, and at the University of Oldenburg in Germany, co-teaching with Christine Goat, also present. Law and language are inextricably connected and teaching against an Italian or German background is a great source of inspiration. Or as Elena Ioriatti writes, la lingua e il diritto sono quindi componenti inscindibili della terminologia europea. You cannot understand the law in Europe without understanding diversity, particularly linguistic diversity. I also realize that ideas once expressed in teaching or writing live on they are worn by themselves and may always resurface. In that sense, what you teach stays. Today I leave with a feeling of gratitude. I'm grateful that I could devote so much of my life to academic work in a period where my area of specialization changed so drastically from a dull course, I apologize to the land registrar for what I'm going to say, a dull course on technicalities of, for example, land registration to lectures, presentations, writings, and lively discussions about the impact on property law of new technologies. The impact of climate change, the impact of mass migration, the COVID-19 pandemic. I really lived, I think, through a nearly Copernican revolution as to how property law is seen, taught, and analyzed. I'm also indebted to my former and present PhD researchers for everything I learned and I'm still learning from them. And it is indeed a great pleasure that I can congratulate three of them with their recent appointment as full professor at Maastricht University, Bram Akkermans and Lars van Vliet, and at the Open University, Anna Bellet. A person for whom I developed great respect and who became a good friend, I mentioned him, was the late André van der Waalt. His approach, part of the legal transformation within South Africa after the end of apartheid, was highly innovative. He showed that the fundamental revision of the law takes three steps. First of all, you need a thorough understanding of the existing law at the technical level, and comparative legal analysis then proves to be a helpful tool. Following this stage, the law can be rewritten in light of new policy choices aimed at building a fair and just society, restoring trust in the legal system as such, and the legislature and the judiciary in particular. And finally, the practical application of the new law, especially by judges, should be followed closely. It is as a token of friendship and to commemorate him, and I asked a good friend of mine, the South African poet Karina van der Waalt, to express this in a poem written in Afrikaans. Her poem is about the right to a flag as a symbol of hope. In my inaugural lecture, I also ended by citing a poem written by Rainer Maria Rilke and also about a flag. The flag was flying in the wind changing direction with an altering wind when on the ground you did not feel the wind shift yet. To me, it represents what academic thinking is about, thinking ahead of developments. The poem is quite long, and I will cite the last few lines. In Afrikaans, or die recht op een vlag. Voel hoe Rilke se vlag die storm aanvoel, koester zoals Mandela, Een laatste ideaal, couscous voor jouzelf, verloor, ontroon jouw zelfgerechtigheid. Gaan, hijs een vlag voor jou, dacht erom. Go and raise a flag for your daydream. Well, finally, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, a festschrift with contributions was offered to me uh, already some months ago and edited by Bram Ackermans and Anna Berlet. And by thanking them, I would like to 
express my sincere gratitude to all authors for their contributions. And of course, there are so many other people to thank. But I hope to do this later in a more personal way, except for one. For my wife, Trix, I have this quote from the song Tutto l'amore che ho, All the Love I Have, by the Italian singer Giovanotti. Senza di te sarebbe stato tutto vano. Zonder jou, Trix, was het allemaal zinloos geweest. It is my sincere hope that for years to come, I can see all of you many times again, living and working in good spirits and good health. Ik heb gezegd. Thank you so much, Professor van Erp, for a wonderful lecture. Thank you for all the things you said. Also for mentioning and giving such a prominent place to Professor André van der Wald, who indeed was a very close friend of you, but also of our faculty and university. Um, there's a saying that when you are a professor, you teach, but when you are an emeritus professor, you lecture. I don't think that was actually true in this case. I think this is still very much you, Chef, teaching in the way that we uh, know of you. So thank you so much for, for that. I mentioned already that today is also a celebration of your time here in Maastricht. And I believe that when you joined Maastricht University, and you already mentioned that in your, uh, in your lecture in 1997, this came a bit as a surprise. Um, not so much as a surprise, I would say, for this university, but for yourself. Um, you worked at Tilburg University at the time, where you also had done your PhD thesis. You refer to that also in your lecture. And at Tilburg, you were the comparative private lawyer at a time when this was really not the natural thing to do. You taught comparative contract law. Um, and when you came to Maastricht, you built up the expertise here uh, and also with a wider group consisting of other colleagues outside of this university in the area of comparative and European property law. You were an early adapter there. In 1997, European property law was really not what it is uh, today. Um, and I have no doubt in saying that you are one of the founders of that field together with others, as it should be in academia but still one of those important founders. Your students in Maastricht very much profited from this, um, to a large extent. Your second year's course and your master's course on European and comparative property law were always liked a lot by our students. Um, when we hear students at other universities speak about property law, they often sigh. They may also refer there to, you mentioned the word dull there uh, at some point in your lecture. Um, they find it a little difficult field full of technical details, not so with you, when you were teaching our students and when you are still teaching them like you do in Trento and at other um, places. Um, that's good for our students. It also helped yourself. And I'd like to cite you here, Chef, where you once said, um, not only said, it's also on paper, so it must be true. Um, and I quote, sometimes when I explain something, I wonder whether what I say is true. That's what you wrote. That you need about thinking aloud in the classroom when it comes to teaching students. And in my view, and also in your view, and I think in the view of many people present here, many colleagues present here, that's also the way it should be. Teaching like a joint venture. I did not try to count the number of students that you taught here in uh, Maastricht, but there must have been uh, thousands. Many thanks on behalf of the university and on behalf of the faculty of law. Like you said yourself, you will no doubt continue teaching and we count ourselves and students count, our, count themselves very lucky that that is the case. Now it gives me um, also great pleasure. I spoke about a celebration. Um, also gives me great pleasure to announce two speakers 
um, in this celebration. People who will briefly address you, and you know them both very well. In fact, you already mentioned them in your uh, words of uh, thank. Um, and first of all, I would like to ask uh, Professor Anna Berlet to come forward, who will address you on behalf of your promotee. Um, and after Anna, Professor Bram Ackermans is going to come forward uh, and will take the floor to speak on behalf of the Department of Private Law. But of course, they both are also going to speak, I think mostly, um, on part of uh, themselves. So I first like to, um, like to uh, welcome Professor Anna Berlet from the Open University, very close by, to come forward. Still a bit new. <laughs> Thank you, Pro Rector. Dear chef, dear attendees. Uh, the last time I stood exactly here was uh, it was chef who addressed me uh, in his laudatio after my PhD defense. Therefore, for me, it makes this uh, occasion all the more special that I am here before all of you addressing you, chef, on this very momentous and very special occasion and to celebrate indeed your extensive and impressive career. While I stand here on behalf of all of Chef's former PhDs and current ones I presume, I cannot speak for them so I hope you'll all permit me to be a bit more personal in uh, my address to you. I can, I can only share with you my own experiences with Chef as my supervisor. And I suppose one of my fondest and most fun memories uh, of that time were our Monday morning meetings. Uh, every Monday morning, we would have a meeting with a chef, Bram, Willem, Evelina, later also Katja, uh, and Lars was also there uh, frequently. Um, and Evelina, and sometimes Bram as well, would bring homemade delicious cake or cookies. Uh, Willem would sit in the lovely IKEA Puang chair, uh, laid back, uh, enjoying the delicious cookies, as would I, of course. Um, and Chef would sit behind his desk. The idea of these meetings was that we would discuss at the very beginning of the week all of the things that we would do uh, for the remainder of the week and, and discuss all of our um, problems that we encounter in our research. However, most of the time, uh, we would never uh, continue any further than discussing chef's agenda for the rest of the week because it was so overfull. Uh, trips here, speaking engagements there in the most exotic locations, chairmanship board and editorial meetings he would discuss with us. And I always thought this was wonderful because his enthusiasm, and I, uh, I don't know if I should say this out loud in these times, was quite contagious. Um, it also gave us the perfect opportunity to nibble all of the delicious things that Evelyn and Bram would have made for that week. A win-win for everyone, I would argue. However, his often full agenda did not mean that he did not have time for us as PhDs. Speaking for myself, it really did seem as if his door was always open. Uh, quite figuratively, it was, at any rate. You could always call him or just walk into his office. If his door was closed, a simple knock and, and showing your face around the corner would be enough to say, hi, Anna, come in. Yes, sit down, sit here. I'm just finishing up this email to the Russian uh, uh, civil law uh, society on, on their new civil code. But have some chocolate. This was from a meeting I had in Riga where I had a defense, etc., or something like that. He was not only generous with his sweets and chocolates and his time, uh, this was reflected in many, many different ways. For example, a wonderful side effect of his ubiquitous presence in, in any field um, uh, was the many different ways in which he was happy to share with us these opportunities that would arise. Um, I was able to make some wonderful trips to China, for example, uh, where he, because he put Evelyn and me forward as guest lecturers there. Another example is that he invited me to co-author a chapter in a book uh, on uh, uh, civil law, uh, civil codes in, uh, uh, for example, civil codes in the Netherlands and their, uh, the way in which it was given shape. When the peace or when the 
the chapter was almost finished, uh, he contacted the editor and said, no, no, rather than have both of our names on there, just have Anna's name on there. She did most of the work anyway. It should be her that uh, authored this entire piece. And even though our discussions about the chapter in earlier drafts would, were absolutely essential to its realization, and I could have never written it without his help or without him. Well, perhaps what I appreciate and admire most about him as a supervisor was the way in which he not only trusted in his PhDs, but also gave us trust and, and, and gave us confidence in the same manner. To give an example from my own time, two years after starting my research and writing my dissertation, I went to him and told him I simply could not continue in this way with this subject. I'd gathered up all the courage that I could muster in a Dan Danish library and written a new proposal for a, PhD for a PhD research. A research proposal that went in a quite a different direction than the one he had accepted two years prior. I sent it to him and had a conversation with him not long after. I expected him to be angry, although of course everyone here knows that I'd, I've never seen a chef angry at all. Uh, but I suppose I was more afraid he would be disappointed in me. He listened to my reasoning, to the new direction that I wanted to take, the relationship between data, protection law, and property law. Questioned me to see if I had done enough research, and then simply said, yeah, that's fine, go ahead and do it. Um, it was a big step for me, but it was also a really big step for him, I would argue. But he took it. And I didn't have to convince him of the subject because he trusted me simply to get it right. And I will always be very grateful to him for this. It has brought me to where I am today before you as a professor of data protection and privacy law. But most of all, it has given me the best example of what a supervisor can and should be. As I, take, as I take my own first steps as a supervisor uh, and promoter, I could not have wished for a better example. And I think this is true for both Lars and Bram as well. So thank you very much. Don't worry, Chef, I'm not going to read the whole book. Dear Professor Van Erp, dear chef, at the end of the 1990s, I had the pleasure of being one of your students in these courses you were just describing. Classes took place at the Bouillonstraat building with breaks in what we now call the student common room. There, you and I had a short conversation about trust law and whether you'd be willing to supervise my master thesis. We are 21 years later, I checked more than 23,000 emails later, and I can not only call you my master's thesis supervisor, but also doctoral father, mentor, predecessor, and colleague. You were already there for a while back then in the 1990s, a newly professor um, appointed to come and teach property law with previous work experience in contract law ready to conquer the field from a comparative and European perspective. The European Law School program was a perfect opportunity to develop what is likely, and the Dean already alluded to this, and you already alluded to this, what is likely the first um, comprehensive course on comparative property law in the world. Especially at the time, and you refer to this too, not even our brave colleagues at McGill with their fancy trans transnational approach, approach dared to follow. The course was based on your research, and over the years, the course kept developing with that research. Its focus went from comparative law to include more European Union law, towards new objects of property law, and lastly, especially also to your research on prop tech. As others around the world followed, in other words, you kept using your research and pushing your research to develop the course even further. In 2006, it actually became two courses, one at bachelor level, one at master level, and for many years, we co-taught, often simultaneously, 
our students in property law. Also in the faculty, you became more and more active. As head of department from the private of the private law department, you were unlucky in a sense to have to deal with a massive reorganization. I experienced this from a nearby seat and I saw how you did whatever you could to do this in the most humane and inclusive manner. It was a difficult time that demanded the maximum from your leadership skills. Most importantly, you led our department through it. And at the other end was new research, new students, and of course still a department to lead. During this period, we worked together on the preparation of the Jus Comune casebook on property law, a first and still one of the very few textbooks on comparative property law. We used your work method, insights from your research and teaching, and you led a team of nine very diverse, and that was not easy, ladies and gentlemen, property scholars to the finalization of the book in 2012. The book has been used around the world ever since. In true chef style, you then ventured into new yet undiscovered territories. You started working together more with the late André van der Weld in Stellenbosch, with Vincent Sagar in Leuven and with many US colleagues. Your work with the Association for Law, Property and Society, better known as ALPS, led you to hosting the annual conference in Maastricht in 2018, bringing many property lawyers from all over the world to your home base. That chef is perhaps the most characteristic way to describe you. Wherever you go, you meet people, you meet new people and stimulate these to bring out the best in themselves. Whether this is your work for the Uskomuna Research School, the Young Property Lawyers Forum, where you've always been a loyal attendant, or the European Law Institute that you co-founded. Wherever you went, you have connected to people. As a part of your activities, you were visiting researcher at the University of Bremen in Germany, and more recently, and I'm so happy for you, a professor at the University of Trento. It was no surprise to me, therefore, taking this into account, that even in difficult COVID-19 related circumstances, many colleagues immediately agreed to contribute to a book that we decided to make in your honor and to honor your career. On behalf of the faculty and of course, especially on behalf of the department, Anna and I collected the contributions. Some of these were so current and dealing with recent events that we decided not to wait and surprise you with the book already. So last May, we therefore surprised you, I hope, at your home and provided you with a, in a way, advanced copy. Many colleagues were, thank goodness, able to be virtually there when we surprised you. But it's of course not the same as doing it in real life. I therefore, Chef, on behalf of the faculty, on behalf of the department, want to take this opportunity to, once more, <laughs> offer you our Liber Americorum. As we have called it, and we have called it Chefsache, for which, and I'm happy to address this finally publicly, we have received so many compliments, but I cannot take the full credit. After all, we were once in Bremen together, where you spent some time as a Marie Curie research fellow. And in the German speaking environment, we, were always, we always impressed you and I, everyone, by addressing each other with our first names and making all these jokes together while also stressing, and that you were always stressing, that this was all fine because at the end of the day, you were still their chef. So to everyone around here, to use a 21st century management term for this, the title is not fully mine or Anna's, it was true co-creation. Dear chef, I am incredibly proud to stand here and address you as the, your successor, the successor to your chair. Following our new colleague, Professor Burley, that we co-supervised here at Maastricht. It's a real pleasure that Anna and I work together and that so many colleagues from within and outside the faculty were willing to contribute to this book. We do this in celebration of your career and especially in celebration of your contributions to the world of property law. We are grateful 
to have had you as a member of our faculty and our department. We are happy that you are still active as you are lecturing to our master students in two weeks time. And I hope there are many, many, many more of these to follow. I cannot wait to hear, especially after your inspiring address today, what vision, ideas and other work there is still to come. For now, thank you so very much, Chef, on behalf of the faculty. And I now publicly offer you the Chef Sache book on the occasion of your valedictory lecture of Professor of Civil Law and European Private Law at Maastricht University's <coughs> Faculty of Law. Thank you so much. If you would, I'll hand it over. We can take another of these pictures. There's one from us, of Chef handing me my PhD diploma. <laughs> Chef? There you go. Thank you so much. <laughs> Perhaps, Jeff, you want to say it, yeah? Do it again. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> the book. <laughs> okay, donkey, donkey. Well, you never know who is going to speak when you say goodbye. And uh, generally speaking, they are kind words because you know, you're, you're leaving. Generally, I, I would say. Um, but uh, from, because Anna was, I'll, I'll end with you, Anna. It's, it's, uh, um, from it was a pleasure uh, working with you on the Just Communicates book. It was indeed an endeavor. I remember the weekends that we passed at the, uh, uh, in the hotel, right? And um, the debates we had that sometimes we were listening to one another because we were one another explaining how a particular legal system worked. So it was, it, was, it, it was an interesting period. And I remember all the travels with you to Germany and how uh, the assistance of Rainer, where are you, Rainer? All right. Um, we're talking to Bram and say, how dare you say chef to your boss? Is, doesn't this man have any authority? <laughs> and his answer was very pragmatically, oh, it's really simple. In two weeks' time, he has to decide whether my contract will be extended. He decides. <laughs> well, it's not authority, but still. Um, so, Ram, it was wonderful working together with you, and um, thank you, both of you, so much for the book. And Anna, Anna, yes, they, uh, the meetings in my office, they were really nice. Um, they were about the research we were doing, uh, the teaching we were doing, and yes, I, 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 I traveled, <laughs> I admit. And I did take chocolate with me. But one thing is clear, and I'm sure you all got that. I traveled not for traveling, I traveled to meet people. It's a way to meet, to communicate. And fortunately, Trix also realized that. <laughs> um, because if she would not have, accept, have accepted that way of life, I don't know if I, I, I would have been standing here the way I'm standing here now. So thank you, Anna, thank you, Bram, and thank you, Trix. Thank you so much. Indeed, all good things come to an end, Chef. But access remains, and we look forward also to the written version eh, of your inaugural lecture. We are reaching the end of this ceremony, um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. If you are watching online, uh, I suggest that you take a drink at home or wherever you are. Uh, and I thank also Joshua and Luke for arranging the online part of this uh, ceremony. Um, very well done, again. Everyone who is present here is invited to uh, the reception that is going to take place in the inner courtyard of this uh, building, uh, very close by in that direction. Uh, please do remember to wear your face mask when you go there, um, and when you are there it's fine to take off the face mask again. We still need to comply with this rule for another day and a half, two days, yeah. 
Um, so thank you very much again. In case you were invited by Chef and Trix for the dinner, I want to mention that um, it is advisable to, to congratulate uh, uh, Chef and Trix uh, there, uh, allowing everyone else present here to congratulate them uh, here. And with this, I close this academic ceremony.